Welcome back to A Time for Change. We are midway through Black History Month when companies go out of their way to show support, whether genuine or not. HP's chief invest or information officer is one of a handful of black execs at Fortune 500 companies, and he shared his thoughts on whether or not the month still holds any true value. Here's Anjali Kamlani. That's right, Alexis. I spoke to a chief officer, Ron Garrier, about a number of things. And really, HP right now holding a really good uh, record when it comes to looking at the numbers. 54% of board members are minorities. 27% of its U.S. employees uh, are, are diverse, though only 3.8% are black. So that's really important to keep in mind. Uh, Ron told me that uh, he, the son of uh, Haitian immigrants, is often the only black person in the room. And I spoke to him about that and what he's doing to open the door for others. My concerns are, are the same concerns I've had over the last 25 years in IT, is how do we diversify and get more people excited of color, Latinos, Blacks, into technology, not just in the technology that we use, the hardware and the great products that we offer here at HP, but getting into the, the world of technology, you know, artificial intelligence, um, machine learning, all that. It's very important for us to expand our aperture and bring in more people of color into this industry. I know that you have, you've talked about it just now, really just that constant uh, focus and it's 25 years is quite a long time. I think we can all agree <laughs> that there are still some concerns about the progress being made on this. And so I, I've seen strategies over the years being implemented, especially for hiring processes, right? Uh, things yeah. like blinding candidates' names and genders. I'm sure you know this. What strategies have you really used and seen uh, that help to actually move the needle? Um, and, and how much work do you still think there needs to be done in order to sort of achieve really true diversity? Great question, Anjali. And so one of the main reasons that drew me to HP was the just history of diversity since Bill and Dave founded this organization, essentially that founded Silicon Valley. And so there's many things you could do. You can be very intentional and say, we are going to do X, and you put strategies in place. And those strategies, in my opinion, they work on a broader scale, but we need more people to get more involved in younger parts of kids' lives, getting into the black and brown communities, explain to them what they could do with their careers, making the investments in those areas are just going to change the game. And so at HP, we have the um, Diversity Equality Task Force, for example. There's many different things we're doing where we're partnering with HBCUs um, to make sure that we are actually going to where the talent is and really talking about the curriculum they need to build so we can hire that great talent. So um, HP is doing a lot of it, but again, my biggest concern, and this is where I love joining and, and working here, is that it has to be part of the fabric of the organization. It can't just be a flavor of the month, lack of a better term. It's gotta be something that we strive through year in and year out and hold ourselves accountable to those numbers and those efforts. How do you do that? Can you explain maybe behind the scenes, like are there metrics that are used? Uh, how do you ensure sort of growing in that direction? Correct. And so one of the things, many things we do is we want to make sure we have a diverse palette of, of resources, diverse palette of candidates. And so what we do is we actively go out and we partner with black owned businesses, Latino owned businesses, uh, women focused organizations and help try to recruit from those organizations, get out into the network and talk to them about what HP has to offer. Um, there's a lot of great things happening here at HP. So how do you get them excited about not just the problems that we have to fix, but the problems that we solve for our customers. And that's something our CEO, Enrique Loris, talks about a great deal. Uh, another thing that we're doing that I think is pretty exciting is that we're actually, we have a lot of suppliers that help us with our products and a lot of our services. And so what we're doing is we're diversifying our supplier base. We want to ensure that certain metrics that we're hiring certain number of black owned companies, Hispanic owned companies to make sure that we're working with them. And we see that as a multiplier effect. So if we hire those companies, they in turn will hire other companies and bring in more diverse talent to our, to our ecosystem. I think that's extremely important. I'm glad you brought up supplier diversity. That's something that has been seen as a really effective strategy over the years. But part of the problem still remains with that, um, you know, the red tape that goes with it. You need to yeah. prove uh, scalability. Yeah. Some yes. of the smaller uh, businesses tend to get left out sometimes. So yeah. I wonder, is there a solution for that? Or, or you know, because it's sort of a catch-22. They need the experience to work with you, but you're the experience they need to work with you. You're right. It's kind of a catch-22. And, and the thing that I really enjoy 
I've worked in private sector for most of my career. For two years, I worked in the public sector. And so I was able to see on the other side what it's like to get other companies excited and jazz and invest into these companies. And so you're absolutely correct. The capital is sometimes not the greatest, but they need that experience to find that next opportunity. So what we're doing is we're actually bringing in uh, diverse owned companies, black owned, Hispanic owned, women owned companies. And we're actually having interview panels and our IT leadership team can interview different opportunities and we bring them in for projects. And the most important thing on Delete, I think is pretty exciting. We're not bringing them in as staff augmentation to bring them in just to supplement and complement our team. That's clearly one way you could do it. But the, what we're doing, I think is a little bit different. Hopefully it's gonna be kind of more sustainable. We're bringing them in for strategic projects. These are big projects that we're working on and they can put this on their resume and they can say they helped this great organization move this forward. And of course it builds up their kind of um, plan of record and right and other companies will say hey they did this exceptional work with hp they could do it for us so we're really bringing them on to be more strategic partners as opposed to staff augmentation providers and i think that is a huge change again learn that from the public sector and now i'm hopefully applying that back into the private sector any issues with supplier uh, diversity considering the chip shortage do you feel like that helps or hurts the situation can you still afford to really do this at such a time Absolutely. I believe we absolutely should. And now's the time to do even more. And the reason I, I kind of flip it is because now's the time that that diversity is needed more than ever. Because usually when there's a ship shortage or shortage of any kind, you fall back on those big companies, those big opportunities. Now's the time to give those small organizations an opportunity and a leg up, right? And so now's the time to actually do more of that. And we're actually doing that. So we have some really hard uh, objectives that we're working towards so we can make sure that part of our spend goes to a lot of these diverse owned companies. Tell me about your experience, Ron, because oh. I feel like that's always, you know, that always really helps you. It's, it's a skill you have having been the only black person in a room sometimes. And I know we've heard many of these stories of some of the executives, a few that there are uh, in these positions who have faced some of the same problems as your everyday person, despite the levels of success you've reached, how have you maneuvered around these? And what advice can you possibly give to someone younger who's looking up to you? That's a, that's a great question. And it's, a, it's one that I'm learning along the way. 25 years seems like a long time, quarter of a century in IT, what happened? But with that being said, I've learned a lot. And so before the term microaggression became a term, um, I would go to conferences. I would actually be the keynote speaker, but people would not know that. And they would look around the room and several times, full stop, they would assume that I am the valet or I am the uh, coffee attendant. And they would ask me, where's the coffee? And a few times, Anjali, I, I did not even get it. It was over my head. And I realized they're asking me to get them coffee. They're asking me to get them their car. And I'm looking at them, I'm a little confused. And then it dawns on me. They assume that I am the only person of color in the room. Therefore, whatever, they assume that I'm the one to help serve them here. And so what I've done in those times is there's moments where you have a moment. And in the moment, something my mom always told me, what is the learning from this? How could you improve the people around you? So I would have a conversation with them. Say, I think you were mistaken. I'm actually the keynote. I work for this organization. I am a peer of yours. Let's talk about this. Sometimes... It's a great conversation. And some of those individuals are still friends today. Sometimes it goes in deaf ears and they walk away and there was that moment. But for me, those are the things I really kind of just take and I, I process, right? Um, but what I do when I talk to young talent is I always tell them, bet on yourself. It's very important that if you don't bet on yourself, no one else will bet on you. Also, when you see a job opportunity, a lot of times minorities, women, they say, well, I don't do all 10 things, therefore I'm not going to apply for it go for it. If there's seven of the 10 things that you're really good at, go for those, go for that opportunity. You never know what they're really looking for. So you really have to make a bet on yourself. And the last thing I'll say broadly, and I'll say this to everyone, uh, doesn't matter what race, creed, color, is speak your voice. You have to speak your voice. I've been in boardrooms, as you may know, I'm on a board also and several boards, and there's a lot of pre-meetings you have. And in those pre-meetings, everyone has a great idea. But when it comes down to the board meeting, there's wallflowers, right? And usually it's a minority or it's a female in the room. And I usually try to call out on them, not embarrass them, say, hey, you got Jan, John, Jerome, you had a great question during the pre-meeting. What are your thoughts? And you kind of bring into the room. So as leaders, I think we have to make sure inclusion is an action, not just a statement. So I think it's very important that we do that. But that's a great question. And again, I started as a repo agent for an automotive company. And, you know, I became a CIO. So if you don't bend yourself, who else is going to do it? 